I'm going to read um, from two uh, books. I'm going to read from a book called The Politics and from uh, uh, my next book, uh, which is called End His Orchestra. And uh, will be out in about a year, my publisher tells me, but I um, will read from it anyway because it's my birthday. <laughs> uh, So first I'm going to read from the politics, I'll switch to end his orchestra, and then I'll, I'll, I'll read a couple more from the politics. Philo on the indestructibility of the universe. All these computers sure take the fun out of rocketing through space. Every point in the universe a kind of eye observing Earth though it's the steel and glass eyes dotting the earth that we call observatories. But that was like two lives ago, and even then we thought we lived in the best of all possible worlds and prayed to angels to save us from the angels under the bed or around the corner with their long blades and undemocratic values. Though all I really know for certain about my ancestors is that they felt about Babylon roughly the same way I feel about Cincinnati. The soul being a city, but not a city like this, or a city you're in, but a city in you, in which there are many bustling theaters, and some people applaud afterward to register their gratitude, and others during as a sign of their pleasure. Maimonides on the indestructibility of the universe. Sarah alluded to this poem earlier. If I have been placed on this earth to test its weathered ladders, in no way can I be alone. It's on a morning show that I see Jean Shallot raging against the stars. In the paper that I read a story about a doctor in Florida who threw his two sons, then himself, each his own story, 15 stories off a balcony, just as his wife was coming out of the hotel bathroom with wet hands. In the painting, I notice that the angel who restrains Caravaggio's Abraham bears the likeness of Isaac, the seed of Abraham, so that it is Abraham arriving in the nick of time to stop himself from destroying himself, which is why the blade is almost transparent the ram waiting patiently to close the circuit. I say that God is somewhere in the opening and closing of these circuits, a light you flick on and off to signal love or distress across the courtyard. Across the rail yard, I am led by the light in the station master's window, though the station master has long since been replaced by indifferent machines which throw the switches and cancel the cold sacrifices of physics. They open the circuits, and the circuits say, this is not your transport. If anything happens to you here, no one will help you. No matter what happens, refuse to take the stage in the theater they've made of your temple. Seneca, on the lesson to be drawn, from the burning of Lyon. The world is full of things far darker than my bad ideas. And who isn't a sports fan when lives are at stake? In my neurodegenerative order, I always cross the street without looking. It's only a matter of time before I'm hit by a victory parade carrying an automaton plundered from the island where every second person is an automaton. In this way, Rhodes is not a store of wonders free for the vanquisher, but a nightmare you will, you will yourself into in order to sail yourself home. When I count the constellations against the gears of my Antikythera mechanism, all it augurs me is a career playing terrorists in made-for-TV movies. I don't know what else I expected, but I never expected to be the kind of man who mourns his friends. Seneca on the brevity of life. 
When we consider everything we've failed to do, does it really matter that our progeny will know us only by the lists of things we intended to buy? Yes, I think so. When I see a lost bundle or a bridge left to ruin, it ignites a pain in me I know is mine alone, though I have never been a soldier. There is nothing in philosophy so instructive as our having lost the war. They're all dark, man. Who knew? Jeez. Uh, well, since we're doing that, uh, <laughs> Seneca on anger. I have to tell you, it gives me a weird kind of perverse thrill to be reading these poems during the presidential election. <laughs> Uh, especially, it's maybe especially this one. God, how I hate when the senators speak. <laughs> when I indulge the sensorium to see what goes down, mine is an ire to strip the heavens bare. Luck has nothing to do with good. Anyone who believes otherwise should take my course on providence and then still be sent to the Colosseum where I will not, I will not come to the aid of visionaries in need. The sky rent, the crowds cheering the kind of scene only an asshole thinks he can imagine without enjoying. Let these suffice as the keystones of my charm. For I am the Athens that gave birth to Socrates, and I am the Athens that put him to death. Um, I'm going to switch to uh, and his orchestra. Uh, the only thing I'll say about, um, about this book is that all of the poems name um, someone under the title, someone real and specific, in fact, under the title of the poems are not addressed to that person or dedicated to that person, but were uh, written in some sense as a kind of inner monologue or inner dialogue with that person. Um, and I'll read a few of these. Being and event, son. On the day you're supposed to be born, I'm in the back of the bus, in the back of my head, trying like an idiot to wrap demographics around my race to the bottom of the root, not to be led astray or blown apart, not to be a bone apart or burn the clothes I slept in, not to claim that this impressive contraption now living its life is worth interrupting. The black kid behind me elbows me hard in the head as I'm thinking he's leaving. He's left my head hurting a little, race and all, my every intention of moving to another city. Is this image sufficiently unbecoming? How can you say hearty congratulations on the new home without terrible regrets on the old? Not that I'm so attentive, I just like testifying against people. Not that I'm the first to ride off into sunset, but if this doesn't sound much like cowboy philosophy or cock rock for a new millennium, another one, two, three, fourth inning or last gasp before X-way, which still seems mystical to me, or the bad self within which I contend with what I wish to do well, then I know you'll know exactly what I mean and would never make up death by misadventure in the English autopsies I'm skimming because everyone deserves to earn an assisted living. Some cuisines will lower your opinion of the entire culture. Yet here we are in search of the sloppiest Joe, the nightclub where shit goes down, a sentimentally physical education. Here I am not really waiting and a shout out to manifestations of emotional solidarity which I hate because I'm all out of jealousy a nod to the silver maple, which I love in my failure to identify correctly, though you will know it. You will see so many proofs that staring at the eyes of trembling giants teaches us nothing about the magpies flirting around Aspen or the coked out fashionistas flitting among them, everything so far away you can't tell the difference between the marks of sawzalls and those left by bear claws or why it's no longer safe to carry aboard another man's trident or gifts for people you do not know that's sad. Let me put it this way. In the span of six blocks, I see a man, Latino, let's say, 
lose his prosthesis while chasing a black youth. A mismatched couple look like they're staging their breakup, and then there's the older fella in a suit and three-cornered hat stepping back. Prosthetic suggests compensation through fakery, whereas fake would have meant there's a trick up that empty sleeve, or perhaps a clue as to what this long, hot summer is really about, and whether it will last forever, like the love of Paul and Joanne racing toward a golden anniversary. And here it is. And there it goes. Event and identity. Life. And as you go, it was the 70s, you have to assume that everyone smelled at least a little like pussy. The anchorman is sad to point out how people don't value homes like they used to and are getting used to real crisis, recombinant growth, oaths of loyalty, and finally worse. The funny thing is how you suppose you have so many years to go, but no, this is the love of it. And there's no escaping the conglomerate. And though I told you I wouldn't go back into politics, you don't have to bet your bottom dollar to be your folks' go-to go-between or to make the next caller on the Jerry Orbach circuit. God, how I miss those older episodes. But I'm not going to talk about God, not yet, because there's no restacking these testaments, the tenements worth of their residents' girth, gargoyles eating hardtack, but wishing for pone all the way back to the age of hokum. Though in wherever you're from, you have to assume night fell much as it does here, and that people were, by and large, okay. Pining for a time when sugar was not raw, and nary a word against Monday Night Raw, because those men are real American heroes, like me, unsure how to watch a sunset without wishing those who have entered my world were more like my world might have been without us. The blankety blank of blank. Read the sorry self-evidence of reverie. Read the fickle ghost of saying you believe neither in scripture nor in all the rare earth that went into the making of the unique names I don't need to tell me I have mail, but no plan. I need you to tell me. What if the life I've imagined is the same you have imagined? That tree, that ruby-throated hummingbird, that other fella in the mist. Who is this other fella, the teacher asks, and what is the mist? Whatever they are, let's hope that things turn out for them as well. That things will come like kids when called. <clears throat> On nothing and kindred subjects, daughter. Contemplating the latest vase by the artist formerly known as Painter S, you're crying. Connie Francis is crooning, and I don't know if women croon or is it a guy thing. Connie Francis is 100% woman. Believe you me, I know a guy who knows a guy. Whatever it is, she's doing it like it's Christmas in her heart, like no one is tired of the new life I'm talking about, like anyone who grunts when he hears an idea he agrees with. Though... I didn't want this to be about debts, how things are always going from pretty bad to better to pretty bad again, like flying a Cessna through our own socioeconomic Lesotho. We're driving across Ohio, crossing the Cuyahoga, I don't know how many times, and if it's not on fire, I'm disappointed. And you start crying. You can't stop waiting for the point in your life when stories come true, but if it's on fire, you can't help yourself and start crying because you have somewhere to be. And the river is a wall with flame above and water below, a basement, an attic in one, or no. It reaches forever up and down to embrace silt and plasma, bedrock and air, magma and space. As we are driving across Ohio, I don't know how many times you can tell yourself that the choice to move forward or back is up to you, but it is not. It's up to you to supply the image. I imagine it thus. We're flying through the suit in airspace, your toothless grin makes me love you so bad it's Christmas in my heart. Never mind the flock of South African fighter jets menacing us forward and aft. Never mind the absence of permits or the ton of gold we stole from Pretoria to fund another church. And while yes, viva la revolucion, never mind the revolution. Gold burns fuel, and what choice do we have but forward and forward? I'm writing it all down so you will know how it happened. Definitely not reading this one. It's, it's super dirty. Um, 
sorry. I didn't think it was going to be that dirty, and then it turned out to be really dirty. What's that? <laughs> you want to see the dirty bits, buy the book. Um, repetition, fear, and trembling. Jessica, first girlfriend. Sleeping too much in context. Playing dumb and cracking wise, I cross out and revise and redoubt and remember the classes I ditched, the lockers and clockers and summertime girls still refusing to step to the woo that I pitched. The only beat I ever laid down was in the first grade because I have no time for Damon Runyon characters to identify the aesthetic inadequacy of the ghost of the travesty I'm watching on television whose rectangular light reaches up toward and is very much like the stone monolith on the moon in 2001. Despite my credentials, I believe in the occult symbologies of the man washing water off the stones with the garden hose over and over again in the morning, though it is the washing, not the man or the garden I believe in. Full of ghosts and twilight, every name, a convenient metaphor for the sadness of naming plants, though you can't put a postage stamp on melancholy or a finger on the poisonous taste in your mouth. Because if no one in New York calls Sing Sing a prison, it's the second sing that makes it so. Ah, no, no, no that's the one I'm not going to read. Uh, fictional Truth, Stasis Adrigovicius. I ain't heard of that next best thing to proto-Indo-European after the blockbuster. We are everyone and everything in the dreams of the boy next door who says his father's arms are steel spider webs, his body a building for which hieroglyphic captions consisting of horses and other animals I wish were real, suggest a cavalry tiptoeing through the whisper campaign, where the award for most depressing role in a documentary of feature length goes to the goat for its cry as its throat is cut and bled into a hole in the step and its body becomes a weight rested from the hands of magnificent horsemen, and its body becomes the only place in the world where border guards have a sense of humor, their doors armed for departure. And where everyone is wearing a mask of your ailing father, you must place one on yourself before assisting others. And where a flock of pigeons alighting in late afternoon looks like burning paper, it begins to make sense that people look older only as you approach them, and where we all fall in love with women falling in love with sunset, it's insane to feel toward nature as one would toward a made thing. As if we're really supposed to believe it's the homeless who have been setting themselves on fire in the woods. And while you can rent your whole life in movies just to hear Monty Clift tell you no one ever lies about being lonely, you might go your whole life without pistol whipping anybody or harming any animals in the making of this song. So sing, animals. Sing horses, sing metastases, for our nature is to fashion more things for our world, though the world is already full. I'm going to finish up with just a couple from the politics. I don't usually write poems about horses, but there, was, there were horses there and there were, there were horses here. Um, Xenophon on how to be a good cavalry commander. First, sometimes different places have the same name, but being faster is not the same as having more time. There is never more time. Sometimes it is better not to hold out for the better ending. Your horse is still the shortest distance to the ground of any future metaphysics. You cannot leave home without it, so take on nothing extra, no taboos, no shoes, no more contracts translating garbage for money. Then, weather permitting, you'll be a god, and every movement will follow the plan, and everything will be okay, even if no one has checked the references of the legions you wish to employ. Most are already dead anyway, and each has a shift, and the shifts overlap, so that cycling through the night, hands never stop reaching toward shoulders of enemies or friends. One fine morning, you just wake up, and it's your turn. Um, 
I'm going to close uh, with a, there's only one poem in this book that actually has a personal dedication. And uh, it happens to be for John Woodward. So um, I'm going to finish with that. It's called Museum of Comparative Zoology. The man on the number one after me has a Hitler mustache. You don't see a lot of those these days, and I'm glad someone else is here to record it. An MIT grad student is doing field work for a thesis on how insanity is spread by contagion. Sorry, a middle-class looking woman says as she skips out on her fare, but I'm not used to this motion. This is where we learn how the social contract dictates that the bus must always be late because everyone who rides the bus deserves to be late. And this is where I wonder how it happened that the closest living relative of the elephant is the furry rock-dwelling hyrax, which looks like a fat bunny. Sorry, but I sometimes forget that we still have things to do that do not involve talking about varmints. Like feeling kindly enough, if hardly kind. Like listening hard to the little girl who points out the window and says to her mother, Look, it's an airplane. Where is it taking everybody? Thank you very much.